Resident Evil 4 was the first Resident Evil game I ever beat on my own. I think that's mostly because the other two Resident Evil games my brother and I owned on GameCube at the time were Resident Evil Zero and Resident Evil Remake. If you've seen the boot up cinematics for either of those games, I think you can understand how those may have scarred an 8 year old me. And if you haven't seen them, I'm doing you a favor by not showing you. That being said, I tried to play Resident Evil 4 at least once a year, and always on the hardest difficulty, which is called Professional. Clearing Professional mode gets you Resident Evil 4's hardest achievement called Heart of Steel. With the Resident Evil 4 remake on the horizon, I thought now's a good time for my yearly visit again, but with an added twist. We're not going to use the merchant for the entirety of the playthrough. This means absolutely zero purchases. No guns, no upgrades, no bigger inventory, no nothing. We can only use what we find, which is three guns across the entirety of the game, besides the starting pistol of course. And to top it off, we won't be using the max health extending yellow herbs either. If you've played Resident Evil 4 and you're looking for a new way to play the game with an extra challenge, I actually recommend trying this run out for yourself before you watch this video and you see how I do it. Then you can let me know in the comments what you did differently. But if that sounds like too much work, yeah, you're absolutely right. But you know what's not too much work? Downloading and playing Raid Shadow Legends. The folks over at Raid Shadow Legends are sponsoring today's video. Raid Shadow Legends is a completely free to play game on your phone that already has millions of players with new champions and updates added every month. Personally, I like chilling and grinding it out with my champions in PvE, usually when I should be working on videos. And if PvP is more your speed, you can always take on other players in the arena. There's a new faction in Raid, the mysterious Sylvan Watchers. They live in the Mistwood, a giant jungle in the east of Teleria, and are part of the Nyrisen Union. Being from a jungle, a lot of their units are nature-focused, consisting of elves, magical trees, and woodland beasts. I'm hoping to get Dudan the Runic and Cormac the Highspeak in my next pulls. And to all new Raid players, they've got something cooking for you guys. It's time to vote for your favorite starter champion. Download Raid Shadow Legends from the links below, copy your in-game player ID, and then go to championselect.playarium.com, then simply enter your player ID and vote for your chosen champion, and that's it. The votes running from January 16th to February 10th, with all eligible entrants being given the chance to win awesome in-game and real-life prizes. This includes epic and legendary champions, in-game items, and even Amazon gift cards worth up to $1,000. That's a lot of money. Once the vote ends February 10th, one champion will be crowned the winner and the prize winners will be selected via a draw. No worries if you're an existing raid player and want to get in on the fun, you can still head over to championselect.playarium.com where you can find a special promo code you can use for a small in-game gift. So what are you waiting for? Head over to championselect.playarium.com and vote for your favorite champion today. Raid has another special event going on right now as well. They've got a new legendary champion based off of MMA and pro wrestling legend Ronda Rousey, who you can get for free right now, whether you're a new or long time player, all by just logging into Raid. All you've got to do is log in and play Raid for seven days between now and February 20th, and Ronda is all yours. If you haven't started playing Raid yet, click on my link in the description or scan my QR code on the screen and you'll get some bonuses worth $30. That includes a free epic champion named Chonoru, 200k silver, one XP boost, one energy refill, and one epic skill tome. The treasure will be waiting for you right here for 30 days for new players only. Check the available promo codes for new and old players in the description. And thank you Raid for sponsoring this video. The majority of the first part of RE4 is pretty straightforward stuff, and not the most challenging in terms of a no merchant run except maybe a few parts. So we're just going to talk about a few of the more interesting bits. There's a lot of places where you can choose to kill everyone or just run through and pretend the villagers don't exist. So if you don't see a specific part or area in this run, it's usually pretty safe to assume I either put my back to a wall and shot a lot of kneecaps or I ran like a coward. Not that way, cowboy. Resi 4 starts off the same way as always, and since there's no merchant in 1-1, it's business as usual for now. Also, if you don't save the dog, you're a monster. As soon as the village battle starts, we grab the shotgun. This is the first of three guns we can find without needing the merchant and is a total workhorse for us. Generally, I like to lock myself in this house, put my back to a wall, wait for the villagers to bunch up, then I nuke them. Beyond that, the way that we're going to deal with most enemies in this run is shoot them in the kneecaps, kick them in the face, then knife them while they're down. You know, just Resident Evil 4 things. Also, the bingo line better be in the remake. 
Where's everyone going? Bingo? I started hoarding incendiary grenades immediately because we need four of them for the Mendez boss fight, and you'll see exactly why a bit later. Also, we don't shoot the blue medallions because you have to use the merchant to get the Punisher as a reward. I don't think I've ever willingly used the Punisher before because the Red 9 is the best handgun in the game and I won't hear otherwise. In Chapter 1-2, we get to see our very first merchant. And we immediately kill him, so we're not tempted by his immeasurable beauty. Alright, one merchant down. I'm sure there's at least one person in the comments that was typing out why I should shoot the water, so I'm gonna save you the trouble and get it over with. First death of the game, chat. After the Delago fight, which is the exact same as a normal run, we have to make a couple quick stops before we carry on. The first is to this merchant hiding in the lakeside cave. The second is going back to where we originally got the boat to see this cutscene that I had no idea existed until recently. Don't know if it happens here right away. I can't remember. I don't think we have to run all the way back, do we? Maybe we do? Wait, let's find out. Yeah, this! Anyways, we're not dealing with that. And yes, you can harpoon the dogs. <laughs> oh my god! Plagueis are now a thing, and there's two ways to deal with them. The age-old shooty-shoot, which can be pretty hit or miss due to the lack of any and all upgrades, or insta-killing them with flash grenades. The scythe guys are the most common, and in my opinion, the most dangerous that we run into, so I like to opt into the flash grenade strategy most of the time. Also, this bit with the crates floating in the water is just the best. Who's next? Who's next? By the time I got to the El Gigante fight, I was way more stocked up than I expected. So at my chat's request, I tried something a little different and threw some frag grenades. And they made this fight zoom by. For whatever reason, I've never actually used grenades on El Gigante before, but now I see I've been missing out. Usually I just shoot him until he dies. Don't do it! Come on. Wow, the dog didn't even show up this time. Now it's time for everyone's favorite part of the game. Don't come. Hey. Potential hot take time. I don't think Ashley's actually as bad as people make her out to be. I mean, she's not great, but I always see her getting dragged online when she's really just kind of annoying at worst. You really don't even have her stuck with you all that long. She's abducted like three times over the course of the game, and a lot of places you can just lock her in a dumpster and do your thing, which is exactly what I did when I had to take her through the village. When we get to the cabin, it's just a matter of not dying. Ashley hides in a closet, Louise helps us out, and I stand at the top of the stairs with the shotgun playing King of the Hill. I like to keep the villagers funneled here and throw flashbangs whenever anything gets a bit too tentacly. Now you might be wondering why I keep grabbing money when this is a no merchant run and I have no use for the cash. And the answer will blow your mind. I'm very greedy, please help. With the cabin out of the way, we have a very important decision ahead of us. Left or right? Left are the chainsaw-wielding Bella sisters and a horde of villagers, with right being another gigante. Right is the right choice if you're like me and don't want to deal with either because we can run right on through. We've got a merchant to merc here, and then it's straight to the gondola and watching Ashley cheer us on like a little psychopath. then another merchant, then boss time. All right, so do you remember how I said we want four incendiary grenades for this fight? Here's why. All right, so chat, what you do? Wait, I'm in the right spot, I'm in the right spot. You back up a little bit, fire grenade. I don't know how long you actually have to wait, like what the iframes are, but I usually wait till he walks again. We back up again, he gets nice and close. Oh, that was almost bad. Now we wait for him to drop back down. We threw this one a little to the right. And that's the Mendez fight. So there's one last thing to show off before we get to the castle. Once you take out the truck and run up the path, normally a bunch of villagers spawn behind you, right? 
Well, if you backpedal the entire way and keep your eyes on the gate, they won't spawn until you turn around. Okay, do you guys want to see, see this really quick? Look at this. Ah! And that's the end of the village. It's my favorite part of the game casually and in general, but not my favorite part of the No Merchant Run. That would have to be the castle, okay. solely because there's a lot more interesting shenanigans we can pull off here. The first few rooms of the castle don't really have a lot going on. I mean, we're dealing with cultists instead of villagers now, we've got some new melee moves, and Garador is still Garador. Oh, he did the spinny thing. See? He's a nasty little freak. You gonna do it again? Is he gonna spin? Spin for me! <laughs> Where am I? Things get a little spicier when we get to the water hall, though. So first things first, chat. You wanna make sure your inventory is organized before you hit the checkpoint. And you want... Grenade out. And then you look up immediately. I missed. <laughs> Ooh boy. There we go. So to make this area as painless as possible, we go slow and steady until everyone is dead. It's a matter of camping out the pressure plate room downstairs until everyone stops spawning. I think there's a gamer behind me. No, we're good. Then I like to go out, take care of the crossbow guys, call Ashley, get cranking, and that's a checkpoint. The next part of the water hall is just kind of annoying because with our lack of ranged firepower, the best option seems to be kneecapping guys and hoping Ashley cranks really, really fast. In retrospect, throwing a couple flash grenades here probably would have been a good option as well. In a shocking turn of events, Ashley gets abducted by a wall and then we're on our own. Which is great because there is no way she'd make it alive through the sewers. No Vistadors are definitely up there for enemies I hate in Resident Evil 4. You see them like three times and only in the castle, but I dread them each time. The best way to deal with them here is to not deal with them at all and book it. Okay, so you know that part with the Red Cultist and how he runs away from you and gets on a turret? Turns out you can just run him down and stop him from even getting there. I mean, I knew it was possible to snipe him if you were quick enough, but I didn't realize Leon could sprint him down, if we can even call this a sprint oh chat we caught up the hedge maze is one of my favorite parts of resident evil 4 to stream which i do over at twitch.tv slash anxiety wink wink and the reason is because i find a lot of people don't like dealing with the dogs but what if i told you all you had to do was not look at the dogs Now I can't promise that this would work for sure in real life because I've only ever tested it out on my parents' dogs. Something happened to me during this run that I have never seen before. In the shortcut room that loops you back around to where the broken butterfly is, a Novistador was hanging out on the ceiling and jump scared me. If someone knows how this is or isn't triggered, please let me know. Like I said, I've never seen it before. I'm very confused and maybe even a little scared. Anyways, there's this trap room where a cage, a guard door, and some cultists all drop down on you. But if you ignore all that and immediately break the lock, you can get them all stuck in the cage. It might take a couple tries though. Look at these idiots, chat. They can't figure out a simple lock. For now, we're just passing through the RPG room, which is the second gun we can grab without using the merchant. But we'll come back for it really soon. And speaking of the merchant, here he is. And now a bunch of stuff happens in a small amount of time. Luis dies, we free Ashley, and then we're faced with the absolute hardest puzzle in any Resident Evil game ever, of all time. Hardest puzzle in the game chat. Are you ready? We did it. With Ashley back in tow, she helps us access the final gun you can get in a no merchant run, the Broken Butterfly. We'll be using this thing almost exclusively on mini bosses and bosses because it does a lot of damage. But I do actually immediately use it on the suits of armor because they kind of stress me out. It's a good idea to have a couple flash grenades on hand here as well because like me on a Friday night, these suits of armor are filled with tentacles. So after we get the obligatory random key items to open a door, we go back for the RPG before the point of no return. 
I didn't initially grab it because I was hoping to use up some of my items so I'd waste as little as possible, but unfortunately I still had to throw a bunch of stuff out. This is the only part of the run where I felt a little starved for inventory space for obvious reasons. Ashley gets abducted again, this time by Navistadors. And if we immediately turn around and jump through this window here, the Navistadors can't do anything about it. Also, they usually take one or two shots from the pistol or only one shot from the shotgun to kill if they're flying. So we're going to abuse that. Now, there's a few places you could use the RPG, but I always choose to use it in this room because I'm really bad at it. I'm pretty certain I've seen someone kill both Garador's with a single rocket before, but I can never seem to pull it off. Either way, the surviving Garador is pretty weak from the splash damage and an easy kill. The Vertigo fight is up next, and this is another situation where we can just run around. It's pretty easy to bait this guy into doing quick time dodge attacks, and on top of that, we can also freeze him a few times. Eventually, the elevator shows up and we can dip out. Fairly shortly after this, we have the Gimp Suit Gigantes to deal with. We dump one in the lava and then bait the other one back and forth with the zipline. This guy eats up a lot of ammo, so the Magnum is totally an option here because otherwise, we'll be here forever. Looking back on it, saving the RPG for here probably wouldn't have been the worst idea. The final Navistador area is right after the Gigantes, and honestly, I just try to cheese them as much as possible by leaving and re-entering the area, hoping to get the Navistadors while they're flying. Beyond that, running is totally viable. We're in the mines now, and on casual runs, I usually like to let all the villagers drop in the minecarts to farm them for loot, but in No Merchant, I try to drop everybody onto the tracks with the shotgun, especially the Dr. Salvadors. Right before the final fight in the castle against Salazar, there's this elevator section that goes either really well or really poorly. Essentially, if there's too many people on the elevator, it stops. All the while, there's some crossbow guys and dynamite dudes just whipping stuff at you. Preferably, you have some shotgun ammo at this part and shoot guys over the edge as they drop down to keep the elevator going as fast as possible, but if you don't have shotgun ammo, you better be quick. The Salazar fight is almost as easy as the Mendez fight. Here, I'll show you. All right, so we stand here, right? We just stand here at this pillar chat. We wait. I was too far to the side. That's fine. We stand here. Oh, God. <laughs> I was far. <laughs> and that's how it goes. All right, have a nice day. Okay, not like that. Like this. I, I had Leon's goddamn childbearing hips a little too far to the side there. Here, let's try that again. You're not supposed to be in front of the pillar. You're supposed to be beside the pillar. Beside the pillar. Watch, okay? Look, okay, now the tentacle doesn't hit us. He pops out, we shoot him. Run. Fuck. <laughs> My aim! So as long as you stay between these two pillars, you're safe. You just gotta wait for Salazar to open up his insta-kill attack, sneak a shot or two in, run to the other pillar, sneak another shot or two in, rinse repeat, and that's it. There we go! That's how it's supposed to look. But, uh, I just needed to show you guys what happens if you're a little too far uh, over to the side there. After we deal with this merchant, it's time for the island. With the exception of maybe like three things, I hate the island. It has the best spooky segment in the game by far, but in my opinion, goes downhill pretty fast right after that. On the bright side, one of my favorite cheeses is right at the start. So JJ, the Gatling gun dude, will one-shot you like 99% of the time, which can be a bit of a pain. Well, here's what happens if you lead him back to the cliffs at the start. JJ, are you over here, brother? All right. Oh, we got to back up a bit. Hold up, hold up. There we go. All right, here's the strat. <laughs> Damn. GG's, JJ. Regenerators are the part of Resident Evil 4 that I think collectively scarred us all on our first playthroughs. And in a No Merchant run, there's not really a lot we can do to kill them. Normally, you'd get the thermal scope and blast away their weak bits, but that's not really an option when you don't have a rifle. So the best way to deal with them is by blowing a leg off, baiting a leap, and then running. Here's what it looks like if you mess it up. Oh, heavens. Oh, he got me! <laughs> I didn't back up fast enough. Now you think that this would be a problem when we have to deal with the Iron Maiden Regenerator because it has a key we need to progress. 
So here's how we deal with that. Okay, he's got to do his little jump thingy. Oh, don't get me! There we go. There we go. So we get Ashley back for like 10 minutes here and they're a rather eventful 10 minutes. Okay, not really because I just run from everything. I am convinced that this truck part inspired the one in Dead Space 2 and by extension, the one in the Callisto Protocol as well. And probably that bus part in The Evil Within. I think I'm forgetting another game with a similar area as well, but I don't know. So you can let me know if you can think of one. Anyways, I just blast the guys off the back here and when it's done, Ashley gets taken again for the last time. Just in case you haven't noticed, I've been using the HD Texture mod for the entirety of this playthrough. It's a really easy install, and the only trouble I've had with it are occasional frame drops and desync and cutscenes. Otherwise, it's a pretty solid 10 out of 10, and I'll leave a link to it in the description if you're interested. We're nearing the end of the game, so of course we're hit with back-to-back -back boss fights. First up is IT, also known as the U3. The first part of this fight is just running through a maze and slapping buttons to get to the real fight. Magnum ammo and incendiary grenades are the way I like to deal with it. I kind of goofed here, but you can stunlock the U3 against either of the gates with Magnum pretty much as long as you have the ammo for it. And in phase two, it likes to burrow and try to scissor you, so make sure you know your dodge buttons and then just throw a grenade on it anytime you get an opening. Krauser is up next, and besides dealing with his drones between fighting pieces of the key he scattered around the arena, this is how all your fights against him should go. him let's go here is arguably the worst part in the game but with maybe one of the best characters in resident evil history this is mike the helicopter pilot and he's great we love mike but this whole area is a war zone littered with turrets and on normal or below mike is decently quick to take them out but not in professional mode he kind of just hangs out until the work is already done so knowing that and that the turrets will usually still kill us in a single shot it's best to deal with the enemies as little as possible and run through this part to hit checkpoints the first checkpoint is opening this door in the tower The second checkpoint is pulling this lever next to JJ. And then he kills us, but that's fine because he doesn't come back when we reload the checkpoint. This next part is kind of worse because they cram you in a tiny little arena with three turrets. I usually approach this part with the slow and steady mindset. I hide in a corner, let all the aggro guys come at me, then I make a run for this turret. Sometimes the other turrets will friendly fire him, saving us the trouble, or we can peek out and give them a couple pot shots. Then you can run over to the opposite turret, do the same thing, drop down, and hopefully be done with this cursed area. Well, you know what they say, the brightest lights burn twice as fast, or they catch an RPG and die. Rest in peace, Mike. There's another big shootout part right away, and I don't know what to tell you. I always get exhausted at this point because it just feels like nonstop action with like no downtime, which isn't always a good thing, you know? We get Ashley back, and now it's final boss time. But first, the last merchant. You know that part in Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, where Pippin's like, the closer we are to danger, the further we are from harm. That's the strategy we use with Saddler. As long as we circle him without getting too close, he'll just keep turning around forever. So while we're doing this, we have to listen for his leg eyes to open and then try to shoot them. Once you find the rhythm, it's not so bad. 
After all his leg eyes are gone, his mouth eye opens and then we can loop him to death. Like this. One short jet ski ride later and we're done. That's Resident Evil 4's professional difficulty done without using the merchant. This is easily my favorite way to play Resident Evil 4 and I'm excited to try this when the remake drops in March. The bosses might be the easiest parts of the run with the more difficult areas being on the island with the enemy and turret spam. If you're looking for an exciting way to play the game again before March, I definitely think you should give this a go. If you like these sorts of runs and want to catch them live, check me out at twitch.tv slash anxiety. Thanks for watching.